listening to The Trauma Beat, hosted by me, Tamara Cherry. Check the show notes for anything that might activate your own trauma responses. And as always, like, subscribe, leave a comment. Do what you can if you like what you hear. Episode 9, my conversation with traffic fatality survivor, CJ Morgan. Start out, CJ, by introducing yourself. How would you like to introduce yourself to, to whatever audience is seeing this? Um, my name is CJ Morgan. I live in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm a victim of uh, impaired driving. My mother was killed uh, in 2013 uh, by a driver that had been drinking for 14 hours. Okay. Um, I want to start out with one question I hadn't prepared you for, but you just made me think of it. You just referred to yourself as a victim of impaired driving. The terminology is different with every victim survivor. Are you intentionally calling yourself a victim versus a survivor, or do you go back and forth between the two? I think I'm a victim because like I, to me, I think of the survivors of, of it as people that have had to overcome, uh, injuries, um, or like maybe, a um, yeah, mostly people that have had to come, there's, there's people that have had to totally rebuild their lives. There are, uh, uh, parents of now they've got 50 year old infants at home. Um, those ones I think are survivors. Um, I, I, I think I'm a victim just if, if anything, I had to learn to say that. Um, but just because it, it affected my life, but it didn't, it didn't change my life. I didn't have to reconstruct my life at all. Right. All right. I think that's very valuable because the terminology piece is is one that I think a lot of uh, reporters aren't very cognizant of. So yeah. I, I always like to say it's, it's good to ask somebody how they want to be identified. Um, now, you mentioned in your survey that there was a lot of immediate attention of your mother's death and that your mother was often referred to as the little old lady or Edmonton senior. Was that in the news reports that you were referring to that she was referred to this way? Yeah, for the first while, Edmonton Senior seemed to be uh, the headline. Um, Edmonton Senior struck, uh, uh, senior citizen struck, um, senior citizen dies following, you know, it was, and I said her, um, her age shouldn't, like, like what was wrong with saying pedestrian? Um, or even if they just said grandmother, though, of course, they wouldn't have known that she was. But senior citizen, people get this image of a little old lady tapping across the street with her cane. And they don't realize senior citizens now, they could outrun, outrun me in a lot of cases. And um, they, they, it just, the, the age is so, is so immaterial. Mm -hmm. um, somebody pointed out on the opposite side of the scale, what if they had been a four-year-old? Um, and I said, that is a different case. Mm -hmm. um, because with, with a child, everybody wants to hold a child that's hurting. Mm -hmm. And that's not the same with an adult. But I think by the time you're 77, you're, you're eight just not really relevant. Yeah, absolutely. So why don't you just tell me about your mother? Because uh, obviously calling her Edmonton senior, the little old lady, that, that sort of, you know, anonymized her, it served to anonymize her. So just tell us about your mother, Agnes. Uh, well, um, she defied 77 years. She, uh, she worked a lot of, uh, well, all of just about all of my life. Um, she was hearing impaired and that stopped, that did not stop her at all. Uh, her, her impairment defied all uh, appliances and assistance until pretty close to the end of her life. She finally got hearing aids that, uh, that worked for her. And um, she, she liked to describe herself as shy. Mm -hmm. She was up to any task. If they needed a representative at work to do something, she was there, particularly with the church. Mm -hmm. um, they, she was on so many committees that um, I used to put their, their church newsletter together. And at, at the end of every one of them, it said, you know, ask Agnes, see Agnes, talk to Agnes, ag contact Agnes regarding this. And the last one of their newsletters I put together was after she died, I said, I'll, I'll keep doing the newsletters. And it was, we have an opening in this position and that position and this position and that position. So I, I think that, that uh, she wasn't as shy as, um, and if she was, she worked very hard to overcome that. She was very gentle. Um, and that doesn't mean that we weren't in trouble. That just means that uh, that every every time we were in trouble was a lesson more than, you know, it didn't get dragged out or anything. But um, she was just, everybody that, that 
remembers her, that's one of the things that they always say is, I just remember how gentle she was. And she she's sounds just like very, a lovely woman. She was amazing. And I said that she had her majesty's smile. She just, when, when, and that was her resting face. When you see the queen, and of course she has to smile, she's in public. But I would look at my mom when she was just sitting there reading the newspaper and she would have this smile. And I said, oh, what are you reading? And she's like, oh, I'm just reading about, you know, and sometimes it wasn't anything. It was just, oh, just, just reading about these people that were on a, on a trip and they got attacked by a grizzly, oh. you know, but it was just her, her resting face was that smile. Oh, that's very heartwarming. Thank you for sharing a little bit of your mom with us. I'm sure that you could talk for days and days about all of your wonderful yeah. memories <laughs> with her. People ask me about her and I'm like, okay, don't just remember you asked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, something else you referred to in your survey was the fact that the media, and this is very common, at least in, in, North, in um, North America media practices, but the fact that the media referred to her by her last name, Morgan, instead of Agnes. So why did this bother you? Um, I, I think it, it takes away the the uh, uniqueness of a person a person's whole name is is their uniqueness even though some people have 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 the same name i see a lot of people with my brother's name but um it's just it's just one more thing that makes that's why we give people first names um and, and you know there's millions and millions of morgans in this world and it just always when they call people by their last name in something like that it'd be different it was a business news article or something but um this was personal and it just reminds me of the army or or a football player, a hockey player that has their name, you know, and, and there you want that offensive feeling like Wayne has the puck, doesn't have the same ring as Gretzky has the puck. Yes. But but this wasn't a hockey game. This was yeah. trying to put a person, uh, a personality on a tragic story and, and naming her the same way you do a hockey player. Just, I don't know, it just bugged me. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that makes complete sense. And, it, and I'm so happy you raised that issue with me because I had not considered it until you did. Uh, but I've mentioned it to some other survivors since and they all say, yes, yes, exactly. And it's also in other countries, like uh, we're originally from the UK, you, d you don't know because I've been here too long, but but it's always uh, Miss or Mr. or now they use Ms. Um, even, if, even if it's a, a 10 year old, um, they use Miss. Um, and we're, we're in a, a spot now where people say, well, my status doesn't matter to anybody. And maybe it doesn't, but I just think it just needs a little bit more care when you're Would talking about someone's heart. Would you prefer uh, Miss Morgan or Agnes or like if they if they were to introduce her as Agnes Morgan in the first reference, then subsequently, would you prefer Agnes or Miss Morgan? Um, she well, she was 77. So she was definitely Mrs. Morgan. Um, yeah. And, and uh, being from the UK, I they when I go over there, I said, I really like it because I'm Miss. Mm. Um, but now, of course, the the, the go to is Ms. Uh, but yeah. no, somebody that's 77, um, unless they're like a rights fighter, uh, they are definitely Mrs. And okay. uh, it wasn't too long ago. She was Mrs. Ian Morgan. She wasn't even Mrs. Agnes Morgan. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so that's a lesson in perhaps, you know, asking the family, how would you like me to refer to your loved very one? Much. Yeah, very it could be a very so. personal thing. Um, and you raised such a good point about, you know, there's so many people, especially here in Canada that are from so many different uh, parts of the world that could have so many different traditions. Um, you, not, you mentioned a couple of negative things that happened with the media at the end of the trial. Uh, one of them was a picture that was taken from your Facebook. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it was a, a lady, she kind of latched on to me the first day of the trial because um, the, the courtroom was very lopsided. It could have tipped over because mm. he had tons of support and coworkers and family and, and there was me. Wow. And, um, and so obviously, naturally the press got the best seats on, on our side, the bride's side, as I called it. Yes. And, um, so for the first day I was alone. And then for the rest of the time, I just had a cousin that helped support me and she wasn't available for the first day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but so I was sitting there crying and, um, and uh, so she came over and she she asked, you know, who I was and stuff like that. And she kind of like made me her bestie. Mm -hmm. And um, and she did interview me at the end of, of each each session. Um, but at the end, she 
after the sentencing, she emailed me and said, you know, it was nice meeting you. And, and she said, I hope you don't mind, but I went to your Facebook and took a couple of pictures. And it's like, well, I wish you'd ask because I could have supplied you with better pictures. Mm -hmm. um, but also I said, well, you better hope that you didn't uh, get pictures of my aunt because they were, they called them at church, they called them the Sin Twisters. Um, you know, they, they're, they're not twins, but they, they're a year apart and they apparently look identical. Wow. And, um, so there's a lot of times my cousin and I, for a joke, used to sit with each other's mothers just to mess with people's minds. Um, so I said, you better make sure that it's not my aunt because <laughs> that's going to be a, a surprise. And, um, she, I don't think she ever used the pictures cause she was I don't think she was sure I think she was kind of second guessing who was in the picture oh wow so did she didn't ask you then for a picture to send over no my Facebook is public and I don't mind that because because I'm a very boring person and, okay. and but um but no she didn't ask any but you know, she said I hope you don't mind and it's like well you didn't give me much of a chance mm -hmm. because if she'd have asked me I I mean the, I, I could have sent her some pictures mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you had also mentioned, and I, I believe it was with the same reporter, but you, you mentioned that you were bothered by a reporter's use of the word closure. Can you tell me about your conversations with the reporter about that word ahead of time and why that word is so problematic for you? It was the same. It was the same. Um, I think she was the only one that really latched on that made it made me feel like like she thought she was family or something like that. Um, I, I had asked her, she said, is there anything you don't don't want to touch on at the at the at the the end and i said just don't use the word closure i said everybody hates it it's a word that gets thrown around um needlessly it's the same as people telling me she's an angel or god needed her up there more than he needs her here or it's, they especially do that with children god needed another angel in his choir or something like that and i said i know you mean well but it's things like this don't close. It's it's a it's a wound that's got a band aid on, so it's protected and it's not bleeding. But any day, at any time, a song, a smell, anything can just rip that band aid off, and it's right back to the same injury on the first day. So um, I think closure is just something that people say to make themselves feel better. Um, you close books, you close real estate deals, you know. But even doors that are closed can be open again. Yeah. You know, yeah. all it takes is the turn of a knob. So yeah. I think I think it's really an empty word when it comes to a lot of things, particularly matters of the heart. And I mean, speaking of opening those wounds again, there's been a lot of survivors that have told me that their wounds have been opened again by media coverage of of similar cases um, or even of their own cases that surfaces. How do you feel, CJ, when you watch media coverage of other impaired driving fatalities now? Um, I, I try not to, but of course, there's always that first exposure. As soon as I see it, um, I have to hang on to something because, again, the world just starts spinning. So even if it's just my own hand or or the arm of a chair or a piece of fabric, I just have to hang on to something for a minute to ground myself again. Because I go through the whole process, not just that day, but all the people that died um, as a result, like my dad, my dad just gave up and died and so you know i think that i've lost both parents and very lucky to be you know 50 years old before i lost even one but um then i i can't i uh, then i just get too angry and um because it's never it's never it's always like oh they've had they've had 10 uh previous uh duis um and of course it's it's hard to even know to read who they've got for families. And um, I, I just, um, I know what the family is going through and I, I just want them to focus on themselves. But after after the first, people like to tell me when there's an impaired driver uh, crash or death, they, they seem to think that I want to know. <laughs> but you don't? Um, it's not vital to tell me. It's, um, uh, the people should know that that unless there's something I can do about it, if they say there's been a crash and the family wants to talk to somebody, by all means. But but there's no point in telling me that somebody. As a matter of fact, one of the ones that came up a few years later was um, up at the the hospital. There was a lady. I think she was like seventy two mm -hmm. 
or something like that. And I don't think it was an impaired driver. Uh, she did walk out, um, I think. I, maybe cut that, because I don't know. Sure. Um, but I don't think it was an impaired driver, but about five people decided that I needed to know that uh, because it was very similar to our case. <laughs> what what makes you think that that you had to come running and telling me yeah. that just so you can wallow in your grief a little bit more well like what am i supposed to do if if they said that and then they said and they're they've, they've got only one one surviving family member and that person is just going nuts then maybe i could help them yeah. but yeah. um you know i just assumed that they've got family that's going through the same thing we did and uh that's the last thing they need is one more person hanging around them yeah what would your advice, CJ, be, uh, if anything, for other survivors who are faced with media attention as you were? Mostly um, concentrate on yourself. You owe nobody. And um, if, if you don't want to talk about it, um, you don't have to be polite. You don't have to be rude either. You just, just say, I don't want to talk about it or, you know, contact me in six weeks, which I know is not the object because they want the story right away. But um, you, you, this is your time and you need to be really, really selfish with it. And um, and if you speak too soon, I know when I read and, and watch uh, interviews, uh, there are some things I said that just simply aren't true. And but because during the the trial, I was operating on ninety minutes of sleep a night mm -hmm. and a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. And um, so I know there's some things that they, they, they're inaccurate. So mostly, this is your time. And if closing all the curtains and doors and going into your basement is is how you're going to handle it, then do that. You don't owe any interviews, appearances. And the other thing I just said is, um get a secretary uh somebody that's not connected to the tragedy as much um and let them field the phone calls even if it's just well wishers uh receive flowers um and like the the one reporter got hold of me the day after and um and i i can't remember how it happened but anyway i talked to her for a bit and i was telling my cousin in victoria i said i think the press is going to be the bigger problem and he said just tell them to call me so from then on i just i just handed them he was military he knew how to speak and um and he was he was on the in the on the west coast feeling helpless and um so i just he was our secretary and i don't know how many contacted him or how many he spoke to but uh it just the the calls did not come to our house anymore good i i'm happy that to hear that you had somebody who could support you in that way in the immediate aftermath what about advice for people looking to support survivors with the media? And by uh, those people, I'm referring to people who would be in professional roles where they're in contact with survivors. So it might be a traditional victim services person or a victim witness assistance program person. I know that's what they're called in Ontario. I'm not sure what they're called in Alberta, but somebody who sits with you in court uh, or even an investigator, what would your advice be for them in terms of how they could support you with the media? Um, I don't, I don't know, like investigators and stuff like that, if they, if they've got work, you know, we're, we're just a case number and, um, it's sort of like a, a dentist, your, your toothache is, is the biggest thing in your life, but you're, you're just, you know, an hour out of his day and he's got 10 more toothaches to take care of. So, um, I don't know that investigators so much as far as, um, uh, victim support and stuff like that. Um, we, I don't know where the breakdown is we've got the the victim support that we have through uh them and public and stuff the public the police um they were very good but it's very scant mm -hmm. um and um i believe they're voluntary um and and they i don't know if they get training so they're not the kind that compares your situation to the death of a pet but they they haven't been given the tools. I think it's really important that people get trained on how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you're right. I think that most victim services organizations across Canada are staffed by volunteers. I know in Toronto, there are a small number of uh, paid employees, but the majority of people who go out from, from my understanding to go meet with survivors in the immediate aftermath of a, a traumatic loss, for example, are our volunteers so 
thank you for that advice. A lot of what you've said today, CJ, I'm sure will be so helpful to any journalist who's watching this interview, but do you have any other advice you'd like to offer to journalists who are maybe looking to uh, support survivors in their in their in the news coverage of their case? I, I think you know, it's it's a great idea um, to even um, in in the the courses that you take to become a journalist have a professional come in and teach a few classes give a few pointers uh, call me um, you know call someone that's that's been through it and and um, because because if if you're going to be a journalist your your focus is get that story. And um, often you don't you don't think of of careless language and and giving people space and stuff like that. So I think it should be a, a couple of days of the class uh, is is taught in any journalism dealing with and stop asking things like how is your family doing and stuff like that. Why why not ask how is your family doing? Just because um, it's, it's obvious. Yeah. I can't speak for the rest of the family either. They seem to be doing better than I can. And I, even, even now, but back then, it's like, w do you see them? You don't see them in the courtroom. So I, I don't I don't really know. Um, one of the things I, I also advise to anybody that's in the situation is you need therapy. Um, like it or not, you're, you're, you have PTSD the minute it happens. And uh, time, time is of the essence. Um, our our guy that did this to us, his insurance offered us six, uh, said they would pay for six uh, therapy sessions, which we didn't take because we don't, we didn't want him to think he made things right. But um, I was certainly open to therapy. And, uh, but as soon as they said that, my family wanted, I don't need it. I don't want it. I don't need it. And, um, but I said, you know, I, I need you. And so I needed them to learn how to take care of me just, just to help me. And, um, then they didn't, they, well, they, cause they, they only thought they don't need it. So to this day, you know, it's, um, I, I tried to tell them and people mean well by saying, did you tell your, did you talk to your family? And it's like, yeah, that dawned on me a few times. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, it's still, I think they just think I'm just um, carrying it too long or just being dramatic, but mostly it's that that um, I, I had no one to talk to. My mom was the one I had to talk to. Mm. So that get, so, get that's there. That's so valuable because people often think about therapy to take care of themselves, to yeah. treat themselves better, but it's not always about that. It's about being a better person for others and being able to show up for them. So what a right. piece of advice. Yeah, you need you need therapy, and and you know if if it's if if you're reliant on a on a church, if if you attend church uh, ministers, the, the good ones, um, that's what they're there for. If you're a family that goes to church, even talk to your minister. Um, I, I I don't attend a church regularly, but a friend of mine, he was a, a psychologist, and now he's a pastor, and so he he helped all he could, but. Yeah, and I've been to therapy with other things, but there's that chunk that I will never get. And that is, you know, I can't, I can take all the therapy in the world, but I won't get support from the family mm -hmm. and all the therapists in the world can't get that to me. Yeah. So there's always going to be that chunk that, that's missing. And I just have to learn to navigate my life without it. CJ, um, this whole project that you've been working on with me and collaborating with me on is all about trauma-informed journalism. So I'll ask you a question that I'm, I'm asking all participants, and, and that is, what does trauma-informed journalism mean to you? Um, I, I, if I understand it, it's, um, it is uh, the, the journalist being versed in, in how to deal with trauma, being, being careful and understanding, don't well pick the questions that are relevant stay away from routine questions that everybody is going to ask um one one of them is how is anybody feeling because when people would say to me i know how you're feeling it's like well tell me because i don't even know how i'm feeling so it's um basically um take some questions out of your out of your routine for anything unless they win the lottery um, just don't, don't ever ask how someone's feeling because from, from moment to moment, you don't know, you go from hopeless to hopeful. You know what? You raised such an interesting point. Um, 
And I, and I, and I want to ask you to expand on that a little bit if, if you're comfortable doing so, because I think that a lot of times when journalists ask questions like that, it is to evoke some sort of emotion, to <laughs> add emotion to the story, because they're, they're trying to make, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this as a, uh, as a criticism necessarily, they're trying to make the story compelling so that it will connect with viewers or readers or what have you. But can you just expand on the harm that can come from having to answer those sorts of questions that aren't the who, what, where, when, you know, the just the, the seemingly obvious questions that can be particularly difficult to answer? Yeah, well, don't forget, you don't get asked that only once. That reporter thinks you're the first person to ask that. And um, and I can only answer for myself. How's the family doing? I don't know, because they, they're they not around me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just, uh, um, like I said, write, write all your questions out. But there's things that you have to be um, um, just aware that it's not... Um, it's just not asked. It's it's no different than if someone has a pronoun change. You have to be aware to to use their their chosen pronouns, mm -hmm. and it's up to you as you're the speaker to to be aware. Is don't don't ask how people are feeling or or uh, anything. Not for the first while anyway, because um, the 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 person you're talking to doesn't even know how they're feeling. CJ, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you'd like to bring up now? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I wrote all your stuff out here. Just one second. No, I think we, I think we've got it mostly. Is um, <laughs> other than other than don't drink and drive. Um, it's um, a lot of the time. Oh, I know what else there was. Um, I think when it comes to the articles, when we were talking about uh, senior citizen. Um, mm -hmm. um, once after it's reported that this person has killed somebody or injured somebody the article like why didn't it for two weeks say 53 year old idiot kills a woman at a at a at a, at a, at a marked intersection you know and I, I liked somebody's idea of not putting the victims and the perpetrators names in the same article mm. um so that i think it was jen wasn't it that so when you google know. one name other names don't come up mm. like if you google his name the one that killed my mom mm -hmm. both names come up if you mm. google my mom's name both names come up mm. um and and that's how i find old uh old articles is by googling his name mostly i also want to see if he's ever been stopped again but um but uh um i i think that after it's been established this tragedy has happened um for the first couple of weeks anyway, that the focus should be that somebody killed somebody, not that somebody was killed. Mm -hmm. um, because because my mom didn't die because she was a 77 year old lady crossing a street. My mom died because somebody chose to drink for 14 hours and then get behind the wheel of a car instead of staying where he was. Mm. It's such an interesting point because I've met survivors who want more focus on the victim and don't talk yeah. about the perpetrator at all. And then there's some survivors who want the perpetrators pictured to be out there and, and what you just said, you know, this is what they did and they don't want the focus to be on their deceased loved one. So I suppose that the lesson there may be is having a conversation with the, the victim survivors about, you know, what would you like the focus of the story to be? And are you comfortable with us talking about your mother or would you rather us focus on the event that happened? I mean, that said, in the immediate aftermath, a lot of people wouldn't even be in the frame of mind to make, make those that decisions, decision. right? Exactly. But, but as, as a, um, as I, I want the issue of drinking and driving addressed more than, I mean, I, I, I don't expect my mother to anybody else is no, more special than their mother is to them. And yes, I want everybody to know what kind of person she was um, and, and how she affected everybody's life. Um, I, I just think that, that his, the only picture of him is the, the courtroom sketch. The only time his name is mentioned in, in that whole thing until the, the trial was on the first day that that happened. Um, and, and 
they um but uh, another thing that <laughs> you, you can switch this all around right no 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 it's uh, fine keep yeah. continue and, on another thing that that uh that people tend to do and that's that's not good is mention that he ruined his own life too mm -hmm. and i don't care and most most uh victims and survivors would say the same thing is people say well what about him i said i don't care about him mm -hmm. and they'd ask you know what something about him and i'm like what did you want his favorite beatles song too i i said i i don't i don't care about him yes he wrecked his life but he wrecked his life i didn't wreck his life he wrecked my life and and so uh, that's another thing for people to be cautious of is we don't care about about the person that did this and uh we there are some people that are very compassionate um yeah i'd like to talk to him because he took absolutely no accountability mm -hmm. and um and uh his 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 uh, demeanor in in court was oh poor me and my what, what's going to happen to my daughter i'm an only i'm a single father but his daughter was like 23. Mm. so so there was a lot of focus on him ruining his own life and i don't care about his life and most of my family doesn't care about his life either do you think cj that that some of the harm that came from how some of the stories were told in your mother's case could have been mitigated if there was somebody to walk you through the media process, to prepare you for it. These are the sorts of things that you'll see. This is the reason they use last names, not first names, that sort of thing. It could, they might, it might. Um, so sort of have a, a mentor, like when, when see, that's all the stuff that, that victim services could do with training is get somebody to the family as soon as possible. And, um, and yeah, because I had fantastic, um, uh, uh the prosecutor and the paralegal and and some of them from mad that 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 did prepare me for everything in court and this is what's going to happen and it blew it out the window because the the uh the defense lawyer was such a putz he, he basically buried his own client but but um you know they said don't don't expect it to look like it is on tv don't expect it to move quickly um you can get up and leave anytime you want um just you know show respect to the to the court and and anytime you want to get out get out and they were they were really even the um the settlement lawyer for the civil suit um you know he doesn't have to but he said i will come to court with you if i if you want and that's just one of those guys in a in a uh, an office building wow, that wow. their only their only deal is to settle the civil suit but he said, if you need me to come to court with you, I will. And I just thought, you know, that's not his job. Yeah. So it would be great if they could train victim services to have people like that. Yeah, that understand the process and can guide you through it. And answer every question. So it doesn't have to wait. I didn't get any questions answered until we got a paralegal. Mm -hmm. um, with And that's regarding the trial. That's not, that wasn't even the, um, the hearing. I didn't know that it would take two years for anything to happen. You know, they just said, well, we just have to wait. We just have to wait. I, I can tell people now that there, that, you know, it, it took three years for this person to yeah. be convicted almost three years. And that would have been such a simple question to answer. You know, it might happen faster than this, but quite often things don't get to trial until two years or even longer sometimes and yeah and even to have somebody to call uh, my our paralegal was great once we got on with her uh she was she was available and she was wonderful um but even even if the the person doesn't know how long it's going to take just for someone to reach out and say what are we waiting for because about four times I, I phoned her and i said i don't remember what what the hold up is and every time she went through the whole thing mm. with me yeah that's wonderful Anything else you'd like to add, CJ? Uh, no, no, I just really appreciate what you're doing. Um, hopefully going forward, uh, some of these things will be put into practice and that, that future journalists will have that, that uh, compassion um, that, that uh, the old days are over, you know, calling people by their last names and stuff like that. And, you know, people would say to me, well, that's just how we do it. And, and it's like, well, maybe that should change. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like it's like originally a skirt wasn't part of a police uniform and now it is. <laughs> so true. You know what, CJ, one thing I will say from the many journalists that I worked with in the field is I think the compassion is often there. The realization of the harm that can come from certain things is not. 
And I know a lot of journalists who are hungry to learn what it means to be trauma informed in the work that they do. It's just never been put in front of them before. So your voice is so valuable and so appreciated. And uh, just thank you so much for your time and for your insights. Anytime, anytime. <laughs>